Phony War, which was a long period of standing by in anticipation of the oncoming Blitz, finally ended in August 1940, as London was bombed by the Luftwaffe. The Blitz had begun. Throughout the next years, 21 other British cities were bombed, and the British people hardened their spirits and dug in for a long war. Rationing was introduced for clothing and food. It was generally welcomed as a means of ensuring fair shares for all. Families protected themselves in air raids by building Anderson shelters in their gardens, by going underground into the London tube stations, or by taking refuge in trenches in public parks and on common land. Women had to register for work to aid the war effort, both in the services and in jobs traditionally held by men. Civil defense was prevalent and the Home Guard was formed. Scrap metal was collected from munitions factories and a war on waste was waged. Yes, even as Hitler and Goring, murderers as they are, come night after night and bomb us. I'm determined to stop in my house. I've been here 27 years and still am determined to defy them and stop here. As long as we've got a roof over our head. My name is Joyce Milan and I'd like to tell of some of my experiences of the Blitz in the, early, in the late 1940s and early 1941. Throughout the war, Hitler was unable to undermine the spirit of the British nation, whose courage and resilience in the face of Nazi butchery and aggression remained undaunted. These are the stories of some of the women who lived through the Blitz, the wives, mothers, schoolgirls and factory workers. When the docks caught fire, as I say, it was a, an ominous red glow. And you knew that this was what was happening. Streets and streets were on fire. And um, the, the sky just blackened over with black smoke and a dull red seemed to rise up from the horizon everywhere. The smoke was above it, but the dull red glow seemed to come up. And then, of course, when the sirens went and these wave and wave of bombers come over, it was it was a dreadful time. The firemen were wonderful. I mean, they'd go into any situation, and while while the air raids were still on, I mean, well, they didn't wait till the air cleared to go. They went in there when and they were lit up by the fires. I mean, they were most amazing people, and they were all people that had just volunteered to go and do it. Other, other children used to say, oh, my father was in a plane, and my father did this, and he did that, and they said, yes, but my father, oh, he was, he put out the fires of St. Paul's, and he was a hero to me. Unable to launch an invasion, Germany tried to bomb Britain into submission. From the 7th of September 1940 to the 16th of May 1941, the Luftwaffe carried out an intensive bombing campaign against Britain's cities and industries. London was attacked on 57 consecutive nights in 1940 and experienced further raids later in the war. 21 other cities also came under heavy air attack. In their rage at these blows of their air might, the Nazis threw off all pretense of confining themselves to military targets. And the following pictures show that bombs have been scattered over London without any distinction of military objectives. In the East End, much damage has been done to business premises and homes. And the morning after this occurred, the German communique said that they attacked targets of military importance. Military importance? Look at it! In a West London district, some houses and a block of flats were struck. Targets of military importance, my foot! A bus was blown over like a kid's toy by a bomb which burst across the road. A 
tram, too. Is a London tram car of military importance? Coventry was devastated, and the destruction of the cathedral was a heresy that rocked the population. But even this atrocity did not dampen the British morale. The steeple of her one-time beautiful 14th-century cathedral looks down on a scene of indescribable desolation. Words are hopelessly inadequate to describe the horror and indignation felt all over the civilized world at this wanton devastation. A thousand citizens of Coventry were killed or maimed by the Nazi disciples of slaughter who kill mostly for the joy of killing and destroy mostly for the joy of destroying. These are scenes of the butchery at Coventry. to be with his people of Coventry in their hour of adversity, the king was an inspiration to the stricken but courageous inhabitants. They came through the ordeal magnificently. This is their greatest hour. The courage of Coventry is an example to the whole world. The cities of Great Britain salute their brothers in this hour of tribulation, but not defeat. Taking advantage of low cloud, German fighter bombers skimmed over rooftops, bombing and machine gunning houses and streets in the London area. An audacious daylight raid, during which civilian homes and families fell victim to the attack. German pilots who have always fought shy of our balloon barrage took liberties with the gas bags and, from all accounts, escaped the lethal dangers of this part of our defence. The personal effects of once happy homes mixed in ruin with the heaps of rubble. Tragedy came to many that day. Rescue and demolition parties were called once more to their tasks. The most shocking disaster of this raid befell a council school, sliced in half by a bomb. The tragic death roll of little children and teachers mounted daily. About 50 perished and as many were injured. Families spent days and nights waiting for news of the fate of their little ones. And when I looked out of my window, there was a jerry plane. Right there, I could see the pilot. It was as near as that, just at the top of our houses. And he went on and he did the most horrible thing. He machine gunned all along our street and then went further on right to a school which he dropped a bomb. And there were lots and lots of children killed on that raid. May the 11th, 1941, was the worst night's bombing to date. The air was punctuated by the consecutive sound of wailing air raid sirens, droning engines, and the ensuing ground cacophony as 550 German bombers waged war on Britain. Thousands were killed or injured. In 1942, Hitler began his Baidecker raids, a seemingly random attack on every town mentioned in the Baidecker Guide, a German tourist manual. The aim was to obliterate the towns, and amongst those attacked in this German version of saturation bombing were Exeter, Bath, Liverpool, York, Norwich, Canterbury, and Belfast. Day and night, indiscriminate attacks continue. All of these attacks were to create widespread civil disturbance. However, the slogan, Britain can take it, was at the fore of everyone's lips, and all sorts of adversities were overcome in order to show that business would carry on as usual. The second batch of militiamen reports for duty, it's Miss Kaki of 1939 who shows them the way. These men of 20 and 21 receive their calling up notices before the declaration of war, and they're also the last of the militia. From now on, everyone will be called up under the Wartime Conscription Act. 
As they arrive at barracks and camps... The National the Service Act of 1939 introduced conscription for all men between 18 and 41. In December 1941, the upper age limit for men was raised to 51, and conscription was extended to include women for the first time. And our first experience of the army is to receive a whole lot of kit and a perfectly beautiful haircut. All three of the women's services are now open to volunteers. Whether you are married or single, if you are between the ages of 17 and a half and 45, there is a job waiting for you, a job that must be filled. Whatever job you are doing now, if it is not of the most vital necessity, you can be released. You are needed in the ATS, in the RENs, in the WAF. You are vital to the offensive. By June 1944, Britain was fully mobilized, with some five million people in the forces and approximately 16 and a half million men and women involved in civilian war work. In 1941, Ernest Bevan, the Minister for Labour, called on 100,000 women. All those between the ages of 20 and 21 had to register for work in the armaments factories, which needed to operate 24 hours a day. Before long, women were to be found working in all areas of commerce and industry, playing an essential role in the fight to ensure Britons would never become slaves to the fascist aggressors. With so many men at the front, women were urgently needed to join the war effort and fulfill the roles in industry traditionally held by men. More women are coming into industry every day, and much more varied are their jobs. Indeed, today, women are tackling jobs that were thought impossible a few years ago. Women crane drivers are a new departure, and they've justified themselves at similar tasks that need great care and judgment. Women are taking to shipbuilding, like the ships they help to build take to water. And you can see they've got push. Girl riveters are fast becoming as skillful as the men. Maybe it's because riveting must be done in the heat of the moment. Recruiting and conscription affected all those in occupations not vital to the war economy. In 1942, Bevin ruled that one in ten men between the ages of 18 and 25 were to work down the mines, providing coal for the war effort. They were known as the Bevan boys. Then comes some advice on mining given by experienced instructors. They'll learn a lot, not least how a coal miner lives as well as works. The safety lamps are issued and the party prepares to descend into the dark labyrinth of tunnels deep below the surface. The journey starts at the airlock leading to the cage. It's the first day of work for these lads, who have been drafted into one of the toughest but most essential jobs of the war. Alertness on the for those men the not conscripted or in the armed forces, civil defense, civil defense was an ideal way to do one's bit to aid the war effort. Rescue squads and wardens have gone to work with that same calm efficiency which won them such high praise in the Battle of Britain days. The incident officer brings order amid the chaos of the night's bombing. Out of the muddled wreckage of many homes, the rescue men carry Mr. Knowles, who was buried in the ruins of his house. We were bombed out, and we were very, very lucky. All the nine people beside of us was all killed. We was, my brother was just on the edge of his bedroom, and another little bit more, he'd have gone right into the crater. People lived in bombed out house because some of them had so much to lose, and I think at the finish, of course, the air raid wardens and that would say, it's not safe to live here. Yes, when it comes to the handing out of service ribbons, Civil Defence has a right to expect recognition. On the eve of the Battle of Britain, there were one and a half million members of the Home Guard, affectionately referred to as the Dad's Army. Camouflage has left its mark on the Home Guard. This is how they're working these days. 
Many units are adopting guerrilla tactics in their schools of intensified training. The art of concealment by merging with the landscape is illustrated in these pictures of home guardsmen exercising at an army field craft center. If brick buildings were the background instead of bushes, they'd turn into the local. It's really amazing how close you can be to a body of men without knowing it. The disappearing trick has been brought to a fine art. A last minute panoramic view of some of the men who stayed as trees for a while to face the cameramen. Incidentally, all dogs had been warned off the course. As the bombing raids continued night after night, people became tired from lack of sleep. Many people living in flats in the cities took to air raid shelters, which offered some protection from the bombs. But the provision of adequate numbers of public shelters became a problem. And so, corrugated Anderson shelters were issued free to those with annual incomes under 250 pounds and a garden to bury it in. In London's East End, where the Blitz was at its heaviest, few were fortunate enough to have gardens. So people took to the London's underground stations to shelter. Those whose houses were destroyed by direct hits moved their remaining belongings down into the stations. At first, the authorities barred the way into the stations, but the demand for safe places to sleep was so great that it was not long before the Salvation Army and the Women's Voluntary Service were running shuttle services of food and drink from station to station. At 71 stations in the London Underground system, tube trains are bringing refreshments to platform shelters. Over 120 canteens are being installed. 48 of them are already operating. When the provisions are unloaded, the canteen attendants set up shop while their customers lay down their beds for the night. There may be a blitz going on hundreds of feet overhead, but down below, tens of thousands of shelterers are going to make short work of a quarter of a million cups of tea and cocoa, to say nothing of buns, cake, apples and chocolate. Supper is served. Mind your feet, folks, here come the nippies. Boy, oh boy, has he been waiting for that. Now then, Grandma, wake up or you'll have night starvation. The girl attendants have certainly got that bedside manner. Well, the hot tea and buns have done the trick. And with the exception of one midnight reveller who doesn't mind burning the candle at both ends, London's underground folk turn in for the night well fed. It's a good idea on the part of someone, but Lord Horder has a better one. He insists that precautions should be taken now to prevent the spreading of infectious disease among shelters. Donuts if you like, but disinfection certainly. Three minutes before these pictures were taken, this was a block of London working-class flats with shops at ground level. Ordinary British citizens were going about their normal occasions, shopping for the weekend, when suddenly a bomb fell, shattering the buildings and causing a number of casualties. We must give every credit to the civil defence services. Within seconds of the explosion, police, firemen and ARP workers were on the spot. Due to their promptness, energy and heroism, many lives were saved. What the Nazis expect to gain from this senseless, indiscriminate bombing is beyond normal understanding. But as we have said before, we can take it. And we can rely upon our RAF to give the Nazis the hell they deserve. Spirits were lifted by the performers of the day, who appealed particularly to the community spirit.
soon, shelter living became a communal way of life. But mothers had to take precautions to ensure their children were not exposed to shelter cough. The shelter cough was a cough a lot of children did get because the shelters were so damp. And that we were like, as I say, most nights we were going down there then for a couple of hours or maybe three hours and in the winter time. It would be bitterly cold because there were only, well, tin more or less, weren't they? And then we would all be down there. And it was very, very cold and very damp. And as I say, children did get coughs down there. In an attempt to combat any risk of infection from those living in close proximity to each other, the government decided that germ masks should be worn. The Ministry of Health wants us all to wear germ masks to prevent colds and flu from spreading, particularly in the shelters. They'll certainly cause some of us to scratch our poles. Oh, lady, what big eyes you've got. Although the masks are intended for a serious purpose, there's no reason on earth for them to be unattractive. Oh, to hell with the germs. Houses were adapted to offer some protection during raids. The Morrison shelter was a big metal table which was used to reduce the risk of being trapped without air. This will be available in certain areas where it will be free to those with incomes under £350 and will also be on sale at £7. It has stood up to the severe tests equal to the weight of collapsing ceilings and roofs in small houses. It should be put in the middle of the room and can be used as a table. When the cloth and tea things are laid, you'd hardly know it for a shelter. There is, of course, the alternative of putting up a timber framework strong enough to bear the weight of a falling upper floor. Read how to do it in the booklet. By the way, where is that booklet? Here it is, my copy, that you can buy it for thrivens at any bookstore. It's called Shelter at Home. Ration books were issued in September 1939 but food rationing was not introduced until January 1940. Hundreds of recipes were published by the Ministry of Food. To help housewives make the most of their larders, the government set up food advice centers. The Ministry of Food has opened food advice centers all over the country, and more are being set up. Their advice is free, whether you want to know about buying food or cooking it. Some food advice centers answer 2,000 questions a week. There are food advisors in marketplaces and food advisors in the streets. They'll give you all the help you care to ask for. The people who work at the food advice centers can advise you how best to use the food you buy or the things you grow for yourselves. In some places, food advisors will help you with your shopping so that you can buy the best cheaply. If you ask them, they'll come back to your kitchen and suggest new and appetizing dishes. In this way, everyone can make sure that their wartime meals are as healthy and economical as possible. Friendly advice leads to better food and better health and greater energy. Make use of your food advice center. It's there to help. Ask at your local food office for information. The amounts of basic foodstuffs, such as meat, cheese, sugar and fats, that people could buy were limited. Bread and potatoes remained unrationed when in December 1941, a flexible system was introduced points rationing, which enabled people to use their monthly allocation of points to buy goods of their own choice, including less essential food items, like dried and canned goods. I can remember once going somewhere and there was a raffle, and one of the prizes was a large onion. 
Clothing was rationed from June 1941. Everyone was issued with a ration book of clothing coupons, the basic allowance being 66 coupons a year. Each item was given a particular points value. For example, a dress was worth 11 points. In 1942, under the utility scheme, regulations were introduced to ensure that garments were cut as economically as possible and to control such details as the width of collars and the number of pockets. Make do and mend was a slogan adopted by many women as they combined items of old clothing to give them a new lease of life. The Vingle hairstyle. Hair fashion the was also adapted to make allowances for the wearing the of gas masks and for those who were working in factories. In the factory, the hairstyle, of course, some was lucky, some was unlucky. I didn't have to bother with mine. I mean, well, that mop, and I was only too pleased to keep it cut short. But the others would let it grow well. Uh, they was on machines that you couldn't afford to do that because these belts going round and they were sitting low. And if they bent over too much, they would easily catch the hair in the belt, which quite a few of them had done. Britain powder may get into the hair, causing most distressing skin complaints. And though you may be giving your services to the war effort, there's no reason why you should give your complexion too. Hair grips well, became at a premium during the war. You just couldn't get them. My cousin worked in the telephone exchange and she used to go round the mirror with a nail file to see if anybody lost a hair grip. And if you gave somebody a packet of hair grips for Christmas, I mean, it was wonderful. You just couldn't get those sort of things. Uh, but we managed to look fairly presentable, I think. No good following her for her dog ends. The government consider that in time of war, everyone ought to have a gas mask. Everyone, whether rich or poor, whether they have the money to buy it or not. That is the reason why this factory has been established for the mass production of gas masks. We hope they will never be needed. But if they are, the government will issue them free of charge to everyone in danger. Millions of gas masks were issued, no one, one for every man, woman and child no in Britain. Put it on for 10 to 15 minutes, one day a week. They were unsightly, hot and smelly, certainly no fashion accessory. But as gas was used against troops in the First World War so devastatingly, both the government and the civilian population were alerted to its dangers. Here in the Ministry of Home Security, we try to set an example by wearing our masks once a week for a few minutes. And this is what happened. Gas mask on five minutes, please. 